Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of completing the WGU Computer Science degree. This is episode 12, and in this video I will be talking about my progress um, through Software 2 and Artificial Intelligence. So, um, I am currently complete with Software 2, and I am halfway complete with Artificial Intelligence. Um, over the past kind of week I've taken a break, so I haven't really been making any progress, but um, I am pretty happy that I at least got some of the courses, uh, course material complete. And I kind of wanted to show you how I kind of approached Software 2. Um, I think Software 2 took 10 days for me to write the complete program, and then it also took about uh, four days of revisions, because I had kind of like a bunch of things I needed to tweak in my code. So four days was spent revisioning, and that gives it about two weeks to complete Software 2. Okay, so I'll take you over to my monitor and, and we can see how this program uh, gets executed. So, um, I'll kind of just dive right in. This is kind of a course similar to the uh, first software course. Um, you're writing code in Java, FMXL, and, and you're building uh, software that can sort of schedule appointments rather than scheduling like actual storage in a warehouse. So, um, this uh, this is almost like a, a, an appointment scheduler. So if I were to run this, um, I'll, I'll kind of just walk you through how this thing works. So let that thing run. It'll kind of construct everything. And then what we'll see is a login pa panel. So this login panel is, uh, is my way of basically logging into the program. So if I were to type a random name and type a random password, um, the password field being sort of hidden from the user. Um, and, and if this is incorrect, it'll basically give me a warning and say, this has not been entered correctly. If I kind of leave it blank, we'll see, same thing, that it's not entered correctly. But if we do kind of enter the password correctly and sort of press start, we will be logged into the program. So the program kind of looks like this. Um, there's actually no specific format for actually constructing this. I kind of just used inspiration from the first course, Software 1, to build this program. But this could actually be built in like console, or it could be built in like something else. Um, I just have it looking like this because I thought it was the easiest to sort of view. So we have, uh, we can manage appointments up here, and we can manage customers down here. And imagine like we're kind of like a consulting firm. We have um, employees, customers, appointments, um, addresses, and all this data kind of like meshed together. If we were to look at appointments here, we could see the appointment ID, user ID, customer ID, which corresponds here, and then information about the appointment. This actual stuff, um, this stuff in this table, is actually stored on uh, MySQL. So if I were to sort of view the appointments, I would actually see that the actual data that appears, um, the actual data that appears uh, from this, uh, from this table, is actually identical to the, to the data that appears here. I didn't actually include all the fields. I only included like the IDs and, and start and end times and title. But if we were to look at SQL, there's more sort of specific information like what location it's taking place in, the contact, the type of appointment, the website of the appointment. That is basically. Um, that is basically how this software works. It actually, this data is pulled from here, which is SQL. And this SQL is just my SQL workbench, my data base is over here, and um, I just go to schemas and click on this table thing in appointments, and there we go. I can see this. So let's say we wanted to uh, let's say we wanted to add an appointment. So if I were to click on Add Appointment, I'd be able to have a preloaded appointment ID. Um, this is the next uh, next integer um, on the table that has not been used. We have a user ID, which is the user that is currently logged in. Because I logged in as, as my name, my name is, is user ID number one, so it'll, this will sort of fill out. The customer ID is the customer that we will basically choose to meet up with in the, in the appointment. And what's really cool is that if we were to basically put uh, an invalid customer ID like 90, it would say that uh, this ID doesn't actually exist. Uh, we have to put an actual, an 
an, an actual uh, customer. So we'll put a customer number two. We'll say this is a shareholder meeting uh, stock discussion. Say this is in building F, contact anybody type in person with the URL just uh, google.com. Could be anything. Now, if we were to kind of click on save, obviously all of these fields have to be filled in first before we can actually uh, create this appointment. So let's say we want the appointment to occur on, on, on 9, uh, 25, uh, 2019. That's the actual today's date right now. And let's say we wanted this appointment to be on around, let's say, 8.30. Let's say 8.30 p.m. So it's in 20 minutes from now. And I'll go on for... Uh, one hour. So this is an appointment that is about 20 minutes from now and it'll last for an hour. So let's save that. And we created the appointment and what we noticed is that the appointment ID just incremented by one. So if I were to click on save again, it would create another duplicate of this, but we'll close that. We now see, if we scroll down here, that our appointment for a shareholder meeting with customer number two, with user ID number one, which is me, has been created. And if I look at my SQL and um, and refresh this, I would see that my uh, row that I created is now lo loaded in SQL. Now, let's say I wanted to modify the appointment. Well, modifying the appointment is very simple. We just click on something that we want to modify. Let's say we want to modify um, Robinhood IPO meeting. Open this one up, and we will basically get all the information here. We could adjust the date, which we could set to tomorrow, 9, uh, 9 26, 2019, and save that. And what we'll see is that, again, it gets updated over here. Robinhood IPO meeting is set for tomorrow, and additionally, um, we load appointments one more time that the actual uh, that it actually got changed. So. It said uh, 9.26, um, but this is UTC time. Okay, and we can also delete appointments as well. Let's say I don't want these appointments. Benefits, vacation, payroll, I can just click on them, click on delete. It'll ask for a confirmation. If I click cancel, it won't delete it. But if I do click OK, it does get deleted. And it'll update the uh, table and show that it no longer exists. So let's delete those two right over there. Little this and the two rows are actually deleted. So that is, so all of these buttons are basically running like SQL statements. Um, like if I were to basically click on this, save, it would run a insert um, statement. If I were to run a modify, uh, save, that would be a update statement in SQL. If I were to do a delete statement, that would be a delete. So that was appointments and customers is basically similar to appointments, except we are dealing with um, addresses. So we have a customer name we wanted to add. Let's say Henry Ford. Let's say address line um, for one Manhattan Street, Manhattan, New York. So for Okay, and let's say exactly. So basically, um, we could sort of fill out all the information over here, and as we kind of notice something which is really cool, if we were to change the city, it would automatically update the country. So if I choose Oslo, it automatically update the country to Norway. I choose New York, it automatically update it to the US. And this would be how to add a customer. Click on Save. Customer successfully added, and Looking at the table, we would see Henry Ford right over there with his own customer ID and address ID, which was also created. The customer, the addresses, um, which are kind of located over here, these aren't actually stored in the uh, in the customer table. We'll notice that address ID is actually uh, the sort of information about the customer only contains like the name and the customer ID and whether or not they're active. The actual address actually gets stored on a separate table called addresses over here, and this is where all the addresses are stored. So it's kind of like funky. It looks like all of this 
information over here is stored on one table, but it's actually stored on four tables. Address has its own table, city has its own table, and country has its own table. So um, the tricky thing is that you're going to have to figure out how to link all of that information together um, to sort of create something like this. you got to like chain the tables together. Modifying and delete is similar to appointments. And we have the last part of the program, which is the control panel. We could be able to view uh, our sort of appointments um, overall. And this is the sort of calendar view panel. If I were to click on all appointments, this is all of the appointments happening right now. And this sort of time that is loaded is actually set for local time. It wouldn't necessarily make sense to have the uh, to have this uh, this sort of stored as UTC and then appearing as UTC because that wouldn't be convenient for anyone using the program. You'd want it set to the user's local time when this time appears. And when it's stored in SQL, it'd be sort of UTC time. We could also view monthly appointments, which are kind of like these, and weekly appointments, which are this as well. Seems like my weekly and monthly appointments are the same, so that's the difference, but yeah. So that's our calendar view panel. We to view our appointment types report. We want to see all the appointment types of a particular month. So let's say September. We have one appointment uh, for phone, two appointments for in-person, and two appointments for online. And this applies for any month. We could kind of just switch it around, and we'll see that, uh, that the type actually does appear. Seems like most of my appointments are in September and in this area, so these are the types. And kind of similar to the report of appointment types, we could also see customer IDs and how many appointments are per customer. We see customer number two, three has two, and the rest of the customers have only one. We could see in per month as well. Now, we also want to see consultants. So we do have consultants at our firm that that is working. We have me and a guy named Alan Turing, and he is a, he is sort of a consultant. So there's two consultants in the firm. And if we were to choose any one of these consultants, we could actually see all the appointments assigned to uh, that particular consultant. So I'm user ID number one. These are all my appointments I have uh, at these times. Alan Turing has three appointments all assigned to him, which is user ID number three, starting at these times. And um, and that is pretty much the entire program. And when we're done, we can just log off. And we can log in again. Um, let's say we want to log in as Alan Turing, and just log in with that. When we do actually log in, we can actually see that there is a warning that there is an appointment within the next 15 minutes. And that is because I have said that there's going to be an appointment at 8.30, which is 10 minutes from now, and the software can automatically check um, today's current time with all the times of all the appointments that exist and see if there's one within the next 15 minutes. And then we can see it, um, log in, and there we go. Also, the program should have the functionality of having um, of having the ability to sort of showcase uh, showcase a login panel in a different language. If I were to change my language on my computer to Spanish, for instance, I'd be able to sort of see all of this in sort of Spanish. I just use Google Translate for that. So that was uh, a lot of information to sort of take in for someone who might not really be in the class right now, but that is basically uh, the entire course, uh, the entire class. Um, for doing that class, I would strongly recommend to um, to understand how the instructor uh, structured their SQL uh, queries, um, structured their sort of Java code to sort of run SQL queries um, in a clean manner. In reality, all you need are maybe like uh, like a dozen or so of these functions to actually do all the work, and um, and I would pay very careful attention to the actual uh, the actual sort of sample code that they give you um, everything that you actually need to sort of run the program is in the sample code provided it does take a little bit of sort of thinking and like experimenting but um, all of the code that they give you will eventually uh, be used in the full program 
Um, the next part of my video that I kind of wanted to showcase is um, is a chatbot. So I kind of created a chatbot for the AI class, and that was pretty simple. Honestly, did not take me more than a couple hours. Um, it's really just got to just dive right in it and just hack everything together, and it's just very simple, uh, very not complicated, um, and I can basically finish that fast and write a short essay on how it works and, and I got that sort of first part completed um, after like a couple of days. So I'll show you that um, and sort of get that set up. So if I kind of showcase um, how the chatbot works. Um, okay, there we go. So uh, this is Pandora Bots. This is kind of where you build the uh, kind of where you build the chatbot. And once you kind of create an account, you'll kind of see this. If I were to go to the directory, I'd be able to sort of search my bots over here, and I'll get a pop-up bot on the bottom. And if I were to have a conversation, like, hi, I'll type hello there. Time start to begin. Start. What is your name? My name is. Ryan. It'll say, hello Ryan, are you seeking career advice? And it's kind of like an image that I pasted. I'll say yes. Then I'll have a button to say, okay, well, what's your current major? Um, this, this provides career advice to, uh, to specific majors. So let's say I'm a computer science major. Then it'll ask me if I'm better at programming or designing. So I think I'm a pretty good programmer. And um, then it'll have sort of cards rather than buttons. It'll have cards with sort of pictures on them of like what I'm interested in most. So um, let's say I'm interested in data. Then it'll say that the best job for me is a cloud software developer. And it'll have a link with more information on information of what a sort of cloud software developer does. And that was pretty much the program, and if I just say bye, I'll just say, you may not close the session. So that was a pretty sort of easy and simple uh, simple AI, and what it should also be able to do is deal with kind of like unexpected situations. Um, we all know that uh, people using chatbots don't really like sort of conform to the rules. They might type something different or something casual. So let's say I just type something random. Right The bot not the bot's not really going to know anything about what this is, and so it'll just prompt us to sort of type start. And if we just keep on typing random stuff. It'll, uh, it'll keep on asking us to press start. So start is what kind of begins the whole chat session. If we say um, something random again, it'll again send us straight back to the beginning and say, okay, well. If you don't, if you don't really like sort of follow the naming conventions, it'll just send us straight back to you. So we'll just start again, and then we'll say my name. Um, it'll be a little bit more difficult to say my name is Ryan Cruz. So we're we're gonna drop the my, and we're just gonna replace that with hmm, and then we'll include uh, sort of a a last name and, and a weird sort of uh, like add-on over here. And we want to see if the bot can sort of detect whether our name is actually Ryan or not in this sort of strange uh, sentence. And yes, it did. It was able to sort of find the first name right over here from this sort of name, uh, this string. And so the bot's a little bit smarter um, because it could sort of detect the first name. And then let's say we, it's asking if we're seeking career advice, so we say yes, but we'll say yes, I am seeking career advice. And this is a uh, this is again another smart way the bot can detect what it's what the reply is. It kind of just ignores everything over here and is only looking for like the term yes or no. So if I kind of give like a really long and complicated answer, it's just going to detect if I say yes, then that means that the uh, we are seeking career advice. Let's say we're not a computer science major. The, the chatbot will only provide advice to computer science students. So 
it'll ask us if we can continue, and if we say no, well, it kind of just, you know, sends us to the bottom. But if we kind of go back and we click on yes, uh, we can sort of continue the, uh, the chat session, and we kind of get over here, which is similar to the first session, and we click on designing, and sort of click on these cards, and we'll see same thing, websites, phones, and data, but, um, but the pictures are a little bit different. They're more sort of design. Let's say we're interested in websites, and it says we're a pretty good front-end web developer. And the reason why it says that is because it says we're good at designing and we're good at websites, so front-end develop website developer would be good. Well, if we said that we were better at programming and we were better at websites, it would actually give us recommendations to be a back-end web developer because um, back-end web developers are more sort of programming focused, so the bot is a little bit sort of smarter than that. And the link just kind of tells us what backend development is and something a little bit more useful. So that is essentially the chatbot. And again, that kind of is simple to code. It uses the AI ML programming language, but it's honestly not that difficult. Uh, there's plenty of examples online. And um, if you've ever kind of written a program that has a bunch of if else statements, like, if user types this, then print to console X, Y, Z. Um, the programming language of the bot is basically like that. Um, and that is, the, that is how far I've gotten in WGU so far and what I've been able to do. Um, I do say that, uh, that the next thing i got to work on is the sort of robotics for AI um, and kind of get that all set up. And then once I kind of finish the artificial intelligence course, I can then move on to um, move on to sort of the uh, exam-focused courses where I sort of take like multiple choice questions. Um, and that would be that. So right now I am at a point where I am thinking of maybe trying to sort of get an internship for the upcoming summer, and I'm going to probably prepare for programming interviews and prepare for how to like sort of pass the technical questions um, in maybe like a month or two. I'm also set to graduate uh, WGU at the graduation ceremony. Although I don't actually have all the courses complete, because I'm in my last sort of term and I have everything kind of enrolled in, I can sort of uh, attend the graduation ceremony. So I do look forward to sort of spending a weekend in Austin and kind of you know meeting all the other WGU students uh, who are graduating soon as well. And, uh, and yeah, my journey through WGU is getting closer and closer to the end, and I am looking forward to sort of completing my classes, um, starting the sort of technical stuff, and then beginning back in school. And that is pretty much that. Um, this is kind of a more sort of technical update, but uh, just kind of wanted to showcase what WGU looks like and, and what the sort of software part of WGU um, kind of goes through. So thank you guys for watching this video, and I will see you guys in my next one, where I'm probably going to be at the graduation ceremony.